I wish I had the exact quote before me, um, but I saw a quote this week from C.S. Lewis. I think, I think it was obviously from Chronicles of Narnia. And the quote was from one of the children. How many of you have, have seen or read Chronicles of Narnia? Uh, if you have not, you, you need to do that. Um, it is, it is a, it's an incredible picture of, of who God is and what he's doing in the midst of his people. But it's a quote where one of the children is talking to Aslan. Uh, that's the lion figure that represents Christ. And the child said, after having not seen Aslan for a while, said, Aslan, you're bigger. And he said, no, you're just older. And C.S. Lewis explains through that image that the, the older we get in Christ, the more mature we get in Christ, the bigger our view of God is, the more we understand how immense and how powerful and how strong he is. And, I, and so I pray that then in the midst of this campaign, in the midst of these five weeks, as we seek the Lord's face daily, which we ought to all be doing already. Uh, don't, don't, please don't misunderstand that. Please don't think that this is something that we want to reserve just for this five week period. But as we seek the Lord's face um, daily and intentionally and corporately together in prayer, uh, that he would reveal himself in some mighty, mighty, mighty ways by doing things that, that we could not expect. Uh, I think we need to expect great things. I think we need to ask for great things. I would really encourage you as you begin this time uh, to, to be very specific in your prayer life and to be audacious in your prayer life and asking for uh, specific things. And, but I, I, I'm confident that God is gonna even, even more than that, he's gonna blow us away with his faithfulness. Uh, so. So in, in, um, in regard to that, um, if you were here last week, you know we began a little uh, primer session, uh, just trying to, to, to prime our hearts and prepare us for the importance of prayer. Uh, I think I mistakenly said this would be a, a seven or eight week series, uh, forgetting that we've got some gaps in there uh, with some stuff going on with Awana um, at the end of May. But we'll have an opportunity to spend several weeks together uh, as we go through this campaign, uh, also talking about prayer and seeing it from a uh, scriptural basis. Uh, as you can see tonight, um, our subject matter is what it, what it means and what it looks like to pray in Jesus' name. Uh, the, the plan so far, Lord willing, um, until, until he changes some of it, some other topics that we'll be talking about and looking at over the next several weeks, uh, we'll, we'll spend one week at least uh, dealing specifically with how to use scripture in our prayer life, pray in the scriptures. Uh, we see that in, in the life of Jesus quite a bit. Uh, and so we'll, we'll have kind of a primer in how the scriptures can really fuel our prayer life. Uh, we'll spend at least one week uh, talking about how to pray for the lost specifically. Uh, so I'm looking forward to uh, what the Lord's gonna do over the next several weeks as he primes us and, and fuels our efforts to, um, to come before him. So, but let's, let's begin by just looking at some scripture um, that, that talks about praying in Jesus' name. Uh, all of it, at least all that I've found so far, all of it comes from the Gospel of John uh, and all of it in the Farewell Discourse, uh, which is recorded between John uh, 13 and 17, this uh, this this last night that Jesus spends with his disciples before the crucifixion. And uh, you'll notice, uh, I've got some scripture verses down there for you already, but you'll notice that uh, in, in this discussion between Jesus and the disciples, there is, uh, there is much emphasis on the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's much emphasis on prayer and then specifically praying in Jesus' name. Um, John 14, 12 to 14 says, uh, this, is, this is Jesus speaking. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and greater works than these he will do because I am going to the Father and whatever you ask in my name, this, will I, this I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Uh, we fast forward to John chapter 15. Verse 16, he, he tells the disciples, uh, you have not chosen me, but I chose you and appointed you 
that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Uh, fast forward to John 16. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Uh, so obviously, there are, there are lots of examples and lots of encouragements in the, in the scripture uh, for us to pray in the name of Jesus. And so we want to talk about what that doesn't mean and what that does mean and how that can inform and, and empower our prayer life. Uh, so let's begin by talking about what that does not mean for us to pray in Jesus' name. Uh, first of all, it's not a magic formula. It's not a set of magical words like hocus pocus or alakazam. And, you know, if you just happen to tack on these words at the end of your prayer, then somehow your prayer becomes more powerful. Uh, in fact, I, I've got this down at the bottom of the sheet, but I think this is the appropriate time to go ahead and go to this passage in the book of Acts that we will eventually get to, maybe uh, 2023 or something like that, uh, when we get to chapter 19. <laughs> Uh, but notice this, notice this story from the book of Acts, uh, where obviously um, these seven sons of Sceva have observed Paul, uh, no doubt praying in Jesus' name and, and, and many amazing things being done. Uh, I, I cut off, or I started at verse 13. If you, if you back up a couple of verses, uh, you see the context for you know, why, the, why these false prophets or these uh, false evangelists were, were seeking to do this because it says in verses 11 and 12, God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick and their diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. That is amazing. Um, and, and we, we shouldn't misunderstand even a passage like that, that, that the Lord is somehow tied in physically with the touch of Paul and, and his handkerchief. But obviously these people saw what was going on in Paul's ministry and they wanted in on that. And so picking up in verse 13, it says, some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits saying, I adjure you, by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims, and the seven sons of, of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible right here. Um, but the evil spirit answered and said to them, Jesus I know and Paul I recognize, but who are you? I, I, don't, I don't know who you are. And it says in the next verse, and the man in whom the evil spirit, the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Um, I, I take that to, to mean partly certainly the name of the lord jesus was glorified he got much glory in that but i take part of that to mean his name was revered more it was lifted up and uh, they didn't use it flippantly um, because of this episode so that is just a that's a biblical reminder that praying in jesus name is not a magic formula it's not just words that we tack on to make our prayers more powerful as if just saying those words makes our prayers better. And so kind of in that vein, it's also not a biblical tagline. Okay, so what I mean by that is not that it's not biblical. It's just that we don't see other prayers recorded in scripture that end in the way that we typically would end our prayers. Uh, we, don't, we don't hear people tacking on at the end of their prayer, in Jesus' name, amen. So it, it's, not, it's not something that we see in that manner. So we know it's got to be more than that. And, uh, and the scripture uh, gives us a lot of insight, not through specific teaching about what it means, but, but, but through our biblical knowledge of what it means to have a relationship with Christ and, uh, and to identify with him. Uh, we, we, can, we can 
get a lot of help in understanding what it means to pray in Jesus' name. Uh, so let me share with you first uh, two different illustrations that I think are helpful. Um, and, and these are obviously not biblical illustrations. These are illustrations from our everyday life uh, that, that enable us to understand the significance of dealing with someone's name. Uh, the first one is marriage. I think marriage is a very helpful illustration when it comes to understanding what it means to pray in the name of Jesus because in marriage, when, when a wife takes the name of her husband, and so from then on, husband and wife have the same name. They share a name together, and it's about identification. So uh, when, when Andrea is identified no longer as Andrea Friesen, but as Andrea Goodrow, that is one way in which she identifies being my wife and that people identify her with me. Um, so it, it, is, it helps with identification and as certainly, I would say hopefully in most instances, it also carries the implication of co-ownership, that, that because the two are one, that which is mine is also hers and that which is hers is also mine. And I think both of those uh, implications of marriage are helpful for us as we think about what it means to pray in the name of Jesus, that we're identifying with him, uh, that we are, uh, as we approach the heavenly father, we are, that we are, we are doing so through our relationship with Jesus, that we're linking our souls with him. And so we're identifying him with him and, uh, and there is a sense of co-ownership. We are co-heirs with Christ. Uh, we know that uh, that which the Lord has given to him, uh, we share in those riches and treasures. And so uh, I think the marriage illustration is a helpful one for us uh, to know how we pray in Jesus' name. Uh, and then from the legal world, um, the idea of, of acting with the power of an attorney. Um, most of us have dealt with that in, in some way, shape, or form. Uh, by the way, different, different sermon for a different day, different lesson for a different day, but uh, since this is on the screen, let me just remind you that is, it would be good stewardship for all of us to think about what happens if, if, um, if something happens to us, what happens to our stuff if, if something happens to us. Uh, I read, or I've seen a statistic and I heard it just a few month, few weeks ago I'm gonna look at my notes real quick just to see if I made a note of it. Uh, give me one second. I just thought of this. I don't know if I've got it written down in a way that I can find it, um, but I have recently in two different places heard a statistic for the number of South Carolinians who die and have no papers whatsoever. Uh, no, no plan for their estate, no plan for their belongings, no plan for their children, nothing. Um, these, these statistics come through the probate court of South Carolina. And even within, even within the church, it is a surprisingly, and I would even say um, sad, sad low number uh, of, of how few of us have thought about that. Uh, so I want to encourage you, just as a matter of stewardship, if you don't, if you haven't given someone the power of attorney, if you haven't thought about end of life circumstances, if you haven't thought about uh, how you're going to steward what God has entrusted to you uh, at the time of your death and beyond, this is a, that's a great, it's always a great time to think about that um, because none of us are uh, too young to do that. We've, we've taken care of that. Um, not that it's, never are gonna to need to be revisited, but let me just plug that and put that in. So the power of attorney helps us because that is the idea that someone else gets to act on our behalf, uh, that someone else can, can act with our authority in doing things in the legal sense. And uh, it's interesting that when you look to this last passage of scripture that's listed there under the references, that's almost precisely what Jesus is talking about. In verses 26 and 27 of John 16, where he says, in that day, uh, and he, he's talking about, the, this is not 
the capital T that day, the day of the Lord, when, he, when the Lord returns, he's, he's talking about when the Holy Spirit comes upon the church. He's talking about the indwelling of the Spirit. He says, in that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. Now, I, I had to look that one up today when I was finalizing this and, and making sure I didn't understand that because that, that sounds kind of harsh, right? It sounds like Jesus is saying, I just want to remind you that I'm not going to ask the Father on your behalf. You're on your own. But he's making exactly the opposite statement from what we might fear him to be saying. He's not saying, I'm not going to ask the Father on your behalf. You're on your own. He's saying, I don't have to ask the Father on your behalf because you can ask the Father. Notice what he says in the next verse. Here, here's the four clause. Here is the explanation of what he says. For the Father himself loves you. Okay, there's two, there's two words of emphasis in that first phrase. If you look at the original language, the, the Father himself, obviously even, even reading that in English, you know that the word himself is not necessary in that verse. Jesus could have said, for the Father loves you. But he said, for the Father himself loves you. The emphasis means even the Father loves you. And I believe what Jesus is communicating to the disciples is, it's not just me who loves you. It's not just me who has been with you in the flesh for these three years that you've spent life with, that you've gotten to know me in the physical, in the physical world. But even the Heavenly Father loves you. And I think the other emphasis in that text, in that first phrase is, for even the Father himself loves you. Not just Jesus the Son, the Heavenly Father loves you. You know, when I, when I say that again tonight, I think about Kaya that we just prayed for, that she would know that, that she would know in the midst of everything that she's dealing with, that the Father himself loves her. He doesn't just love Jesus, who is the, who is the easy one to love. Let us be honest with, it, with ourselves. I'm sure Jesus was a lot easier to love than all of us because he didn't mess up. But this is Jesus saying, even the Father loves you. Now, why is that? Because you have loved me. Notice how important that relationship with Jesus is. The Father loves us because we have loved Jesus and has believed that he came from God. So as we think about that power of attorney illustration, this is Jesus telling us, it's not just that I have to act on your behalf, but you can act on your own behalf through my name, through the power of my name. Now, we can't take that one too far. We can't take that illustration too far or even the implication of what Jesus says too far because we know he does mediate for us. He is interceding for us. So in that, in that sentence, in that verse, um, I don't think he's saying I'm not praying for you, but I, I don't have to because you can go for yourself. You have that kind of access. Uh, so I, I hope those two earthly illustrations uh, will help us to think about what it means to pray in Jesus' name. And I hope whether we say those words or not at the end of a prayer, um, I mean, I, I typically say them, but not all the time. Uh, it, was, it was interesting because I was planning on teaching on this anyway, and someone came to me this week and was talking about uh, dealing with a Jewish friend and praying for them and, and said, I want to I wanna pray in such a way in their presence that that I won't turn them off and I won't close the door immediately. So do I pray in Jesus' name or not? You know, I, you know, I don't want to cower away from that. And I said, my personal opinion is, if you don't say it because you're ashamed of saying it, then you ought to say it. It, it shouldn't be because you're embarrassed, but if, if the Lord truly gives you the sense that that not saying those words might give you a greater opportunity for ministry, at least in the moment. Um, I think that's where it's helpful for us to know it's not about, it's not about magic words of, of, of saying it verbally, although I think it's important for us to say it verbally more often than not because we need the reminder. 
I don't know about you, but I'm forgetful. And I need that reminder on a regular basis that, that my prayers are only effective because of the authority that has been granted me through Christ. So uh, here are some words that I think will help us uh, to remember more of what it means to, um, to pray in Jesus' name. The first, the first word is renunciation. That we are renouncing our own power and our own authority. That when we, when we pray in Jesus' name, we are admitting the powerlessness of our name. Um, you, 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 we all know somebody who's a name dropper. You know, they like to, they like to put the names of people they know that know them uh, in, in every story they can because they're, they're trying to get that uh, wow factor. But even in doing that, when we have the name fact, when we have the name dropping of Jesus, it should remind us that our name doesn't carry any kind of significance, that uh, we are renouncing our own um, our own power. We are admitting our own powerlessness. And that's exactly what Jesus says in John 15, 5. Um, this is such a great verse because it cuts both ways. And, and at different times in our life, we need the different slices that this verse brings. Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So here's why I say this verse cuts both ways, because there's times in our life that we need to be encouraged, that we feel like we're hopeless, that we feel like we're powerless, that we feel like we can't accomplish anything, that we feel like we're not up to the task, that we feel like we can't do anything of significance for the Lord. Mm -hmm. And at those times, we need to hear, if you will abide in me, if you will remain in me, you can bear much fruit. Regardless of what you might think of yourself, regardless of what you think your limitations are, regardless of what you think your speaking skills are or your spiritual gifts are, if you will stick with Jesus and if you will remain in him, you can bear much fruit. And sometimes that's exactly the encouragement that we need to hear. But sometimes the rebuke that we need to hear is, apart from me, you can't do anything. We, we need to be reminded of the powerlessness of our own selves because maybe I'm just speaking for me, but I struggle with the latter part more than the former part. Uh, I, I struggle with, with pride more than with self-doubt. And I, this is a great reminder to me on a regular basis that, you know, you think you're all that in a bag of chips, but you can't do anything without me. And so when we pray in Jesus' name, that's part of what that is. That's part of that reminder to us that we are renouncing ourselves. We're admitting our own powerlessness. Uh, the second word is the word submission. I have this biblical quote here, yet not as I will, but as you will. Uh, where does that come from? That's from the Garden of Eden. That's, that's Jesus submitting his will to the will of the Father. Saying, Lord, if there's, what's that? I said Eden. Uh, yeah, Adam said just the opposite, right? Uh, I was just checking to see if y'all were listening well. You passed tonight. Good job. I'll have to make note of that. I don't need to use that illustration anymore. Um, yeah, Adam said precisely the opposite. Adam said, not, not your will, Lord, but my will. I want to do it my way. Jesus, the new Adam, the better Adam, for those of you who are here at our Good Friday service and, uh, and heard that comparison, Jesus is the better Adam because he, he, he stood up to the temptation in a way that, that was successful. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, you, you would think I would remember that since I've been there, um, where he said, not as I will, but as you will. So we're submitting ourselves to the will of the Father. Um, I, I really don't have great answers for all of the hard things that we read in these verses ahead. Uh, if we go back to the references here and we, we, we read about these greater works that we can do, and if you ask me anything in my name, I'll do it, and uh, whatever you ask in my name, I'll give it. I, I wish I had a really good explanation for why that doesn't seem to be true and why is it that sometimes we pray and we're not, we're not hearing and we're not getting the answers, but I, but I know 
I know that part of that is that when we are perfectly submitted to the Heavenly Father, we're asking different stuff. There are, there are certain things and there are certain times for certain things that you can't ask for those things and be doing it in submission to the will of Jesus. Um, now that doesn't, I, I, I won't go so far as to say that simplifies that question. Um, but I know that to pray in the name of Jesus and to submit our will to his is to align ourselves with the will of God. By the way, we'll talk about this more next week when we talk about praying scripture, but that's one of the reasons that it's so helpful to pray scripture. Because if the words of your prayer originate in the heart of God and not in the heart of man, you know you're praying the will of God. It's just a matter of uh, the correct application. But I, I believe that's one of the reasons why, why praying scripture is so helpful is because it does help us submit our own desires and preferences to the will of God. So submission is a huge part of praying in the name of Jesus. Uh, mediation is a huge part of praying in the name of Jesus. Uh, recognizing that, that our prayers are sent to the Father by way of the Son. Um, now, it, you, you can press these illustrations too far and, 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 and get in trouble with thinking, well, I thought we had access ourselves. We do have our own access, but our access is through Jesus. And so Jesus is the mediator for us. And so when we're praying in his name, as I have here uh, on the, the handout, and I don't think I put, have a slide here for this, for this blank, but I'll go ahead and give it to you now, uh, that when we pray in the name of Jesus and we remember his mediation, it should remind us of the price of admission that we are able to enter into the Holy of Holies and have access to God because of what Christ has done for us. And when I think about that price of admission, uh, the first verse that comes to my mind is uh, Hebrews chapter four, this text that we looked at um, on Easter Sunday last year. Since then, we have a great high priest. This is verse 14 of, of Hebrews 4. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confessions. Uh, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect was tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then, let us for that reason, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So when we pray in the name of Jesus, we remember his mediation, that he is, he's the only way that we have access to the Father. That's what he said to the disciples in John 14, 6. I am the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except through me. Uh, of course, he's talking ultimately about salvation in that sense, but the same is true for our prayer life. Our prayers can't get to the Heavenly Father except through uh, the ministry of the Lord Jesus. Uh, Ephesians 3, verses 11 and 12, where Paul is talking about the church revealing the manifest wisdom of God and he says, this was, this was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. Uh, sounds like either Paul read Hebrews or the writer of Hebrews read Ephesians, because they're talking about the same thing. They're talking about the boldness and the access that we have to the Heavenly Father through our faith in Christ. And then Paul says... In 1 Timothy 2, there is one God, there is one mediator between God and man, and that is the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all. We don't have a hope of having a relationship with God or having access to God or having conversation with God except through the ransom that was paid for us through the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. And so as we pray in his name, it's, it's wrapping all of that up, whether we do it verbally or just spiritually and, and kind of by way of reminder, it, it, is, it is reminding us of the mediation of Jesus. And when we're thinking about that mediation, never forget about the price of admission. Never forget about the price that he paid with his own life that we might have life through him. 
Uh, and then the final word tonight is the word representation. That when we pray in his name, it is a reminder that we represent him, that we are his ambassadors. Uh, we act on his behalf. Just like when we pray, uh, we know that because of what he's done, we can approach God. But now that we're here in the world, we are acting on his behalf and we are, we are his ambassadors. We represent him. And it should be a reminder that um, and it, it reflects our taking on the character of Christ. Uh, I, I think that whether that was the, uh, the narrow implication of what it means to take the name of the Lord in vain, um, I, I don't think that's the narrow implication of the Ten Commandments, but I believe a, a broad application of that is that we take the name of our Lord in vain when we call ourselves Christians, when we call ourselves those who believe in God, but we don't take on his character. We've, we've taken on his name in vain. We're not, we're not doing justice to who he is. And so when we pray in his name, it, it's a great reminder that we are his representatives. Uh, just like when we play church league softball, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't typically wear jerseys, but if we did, they would say Utica and it would, it would remind people that we're playing with that, that we belong to this church and we, we represent this church and the character of this church and more so the character of our savior. And it's just a great reminder of how we are to live his life, or how we are to live our lives. And it's a reminder of what uh, Paul charged us with in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, um, probably the, the, the chapter that I like to quote uh, more than any other, the, the chapter from which I, I get the verse, uh, for our sake God made him who knew no sin, that we might, that, who knew no sin to be sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God. Uh, but if you, if you go back up a few verses, let me just read to you uh, from be beginning in verse 17, reading down to verse 20. Uh, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Uh, that's why we're putting so much emphasis right now, uh, it, not just right now, but especially right now, on personal evangelism, because that's the ministry that God has given us, the ministry of reconciliation, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. Think about how humbling that is for God to be making his appeal to other people here on this earth through our lives. And as we pray in Jesus' name, as we live in Jesus' name, as we seek to live up to Jesus' name, I pray that we will continue to take on the character of Christ and um, grab hold of the, the treasures and the riches of Christ and to, to dwell in the security of Christ as we seek to continue to be his for all time. Uh, let's pray together.